All right, today we're, we have a wonderful talk uh, by C.C. Trullo. Uh, that's that's as much as we're gonna, yeah, I'm not you gonna... can give us the rest of it. Yeah. So yes, rest of the announcements. Yes, these are recorded. Y'all just got that. If you wouldn't mind turning on your video, I'm sure CC would prefer to look at faces. We don't care if you're eating, although eating onion rings would be very fun right now. We just don't have any for National Onion Ring so Day. So just grab them. Grab them and eat them. That was a good grab, actually. Oh. Anyway, um, if you have cases and all of that, please keep that coming. Um, if there's more than one person in your room, please chat that in so we make sure everybody gets the credit for that free CME. Yeah. Free CME. Oh and remember, we got some fun things coming up uh, on the Tuesday Echo, the perioperative management next week. The no, following Wednesday. A month from now. A month from now. Yeah. The following Wednesday, we have, or next Wednesday, we have our, I'm sorry, June 29th, we have Murray That's McAllister on. Wednesday. And that should be a wonderful talk. He, uh, I think everybody's seen him speak before. It's always great. Yes. And then we are going to let you have the 4th of July week off. Yep. Take your vacation. <laughs> All right. Uh, remember, we do offer technical assistance. If you have some patient issues or something you want to throw by us, please feel free to do that. Remember, Aaron will also uh, kind of take some of those calls. So uh, cell phones are there, emails are there. Uh, please just let us know if you need any help. Okay, the Online Resource Center, we're continuing to update this, but this is where you can get information on all the different echoes, get the recordings. Everything if you, you have want. questions, let us know. We can always send you the link too. And then case presentation forms are also on that site. It's a little complicated slide, sorry. Just get on there, find the echo thing and you can fill out case presentation there. You can email it in if you want one. It's in the announcement slides. Otherwise, just free case presentation like Charlie will be doing today. It's just wing also it. So cool. Just wing it. All right, next slide. And remember the podcast, and I can't even, I don't even know what came out today. Opioids as weapons. Opioids as weapons. I uh, smile and I shouldn't on that. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's today's one. We have, we're doing a bunch more with Charlie that'll be coming out in the near future as well. So lots of fun uh, ones coming out. All right. So we can take ours down. And so we'll introduce, introduce CC. I'll let you fully introduce yourself, but she's the founder and executive director of Terabinth Refuge. And I'm just going to let yourself do your own announcements because I think I think introducing yourself would be much better than anything I can Google. So, OK, um, hello, everyone. I'm first going to try to get my screen up and I am never very good at this, but um, OK. So, yes, my name is Cynthia and it's Terlaquist said, and I am the founder and director of um, Terabinth Refuge and have worked in the area of sex trafficking and exploitation for quite a few years because um, prior to starting Terabinth Refuge in 2016, I worked for almost 24 years at a place called the Heartland Girls Ranch and working with girls with emotional behavioral issues. And then uh, fast forward, um, I got involved in Safe Harbor in our state, which I'm sure many of you are aware of the Safe Harbor Law and helped to develop the Safe Harbor No Wrong Door model for you, um, got to be part of seeing it jump to ages 24 and under um, with the legislature, and then um, opened the Hearts for Freedom program at the Heartland Girls Ranch and worked, you know, with sex traffic teens. Only later to really recognize there wasn't much in our state for adults. And so felt very led to open the Terabinth Refuge, which um, is here in the St. Cloud, central Minnesota community. And so that is what I'm doing, working with women 18 years and older. And we do have room in our shelter for um, one mom and a baby at this point in both our shelter and transition. So um, that's the work I'm doing. and. Um, jump into my presentation. Now I gotta make sure I'm getting the right thing <laughs> to advance. Okay, so my objectives really is to help people identify the victims. And it's there really is a lack in people's understanding necessarily because victims do not just, hey, I'm being trafficked, I'm being exploited. So um, understanding and identifying, understanding the physical and psychological indicators and the responses that we as professionals should have and understanding the barriers to healing. And then also just knowledge about how we at Terramanth Refuge are working with these um, victims. So as many of you probably know, 
um, trafficking is happening every hour, every minute, and really um, requires a long-term um, commitment to combating it because there is so much going on. It's It always floors me when I talk to professionals and speak in communities and people, what, that's happening here? You know, people still, many people still don't realize how prevalent it is. Um, there is no perfect victim or crime. It can happen to anyone. Um, there are definitely different things that make people more vulnerable and susceptible. Every traffic, every victim has a different story. And so we can't just, um, you know, a lot of times people right away think, oh, it's that person who got thrown in the trunk of a car and driven away. And that can happen, but it's not as common. And then also when we talk about ages, um, they're really in entry. There really is no average age of entry. Um, they tend to think it's about now at about 12 to 14 to six, 15 years of age. Um, but we know that these victims uh, are first exploited most often when by the time they're adults, they've been victimized since, since their youth. And then as for numbers, again, there's no accurate numbers. We have the um, national hotline that takes in calls, but this is just scratching the surface. And so um, we know that in our world, in our country, in our state, in our um, in Minnesota here in our communities, there is trafficking going on, and it is very common. And we also know that homelessness drastically increases uh, the vulnerability for folks to be exploited in traffic. So um, there is no shortage of demand. It is the second um, largest black market. Um, business in the world behind drugs, which we were talking about some today. And it really takes highly skilled traffickers who are, they are really training themselves, eat, um, each other. There are actually books on Amazon you can get to be a good trafficker. And um, they use power, control, abuse, you know, um, threats of abuse, blackmail, all sorts of things to keep their victims in their control. And so um, it is a very violent, very abusive, very difficult situation for those that are trapped in it. So this statement is, is pretty stark. I was in the eight, ER 18 times and no one even asked me if I was really okay. And so um, what this is saying that 88% of survivors report that they've been in contact with the help worker, but only 6% say they've treated a victim. So we're missing victims. We're missing um, those that have um, this issue in their life. And we're looking, treating the symptoms or we're treating the dependency or we're treating, but not recognizing that there's a lot more going on. And so it's so important for us to be able to identify and to know who is a victim and who needs additional services. Just some indicators you might be familiar with already. Um, we find that tattoos and branding is pretty common for victims. Often the trafficker um, is looking to uh, make that, that's their, they own this woman, so that's their, their, their brand or their name or whatever to prove that this person belongs to them. And then we're often finding victims with all sorts of um, signs of physical trauma and most often they haven't been attended to. So we're talking about bruises and cigarette burns and scars, often um, things in, in their hair where it's not going to show bruises and, and, and bumps. History of strangulation, knife wounds, firearms. I have a, a dear friend, a gal who was exploited in traffic for many years who still has a bullet lodged in her ankle that just they never felt they could take that out. Just knowing she was always under the threat of, of dying. Um, scars from unattended injuries, malnutrition, not getting food as needed, and then and then now drug and chemical dependency. So sometimes when a victim's picked up on the street, you might find someone who's addicted and they're combative and uncooperative, but there's a lot going on that has to be identified. So I know this isn't a very easy to read um, slide, but I really wanted to point out how um, the impact, and when we talk about CSEC, that's child sexual exploit, um, child exploit, I'm sorry, the sexual exploitation of a child, commercial sexual exploitation of a child. And, but really this fits for anyone. And we have to think about the fact that it's a very, um, a problem that really deals with their whole being. And so their whole being needs to be um, offered healing to really escape 
um, this kind of life. And so when we talk about psychological and emotional impact, you know, of course, there's all the mental health of PTSD and anxiety and depression and paranoia, um, sleep disturbances, all those type of things. And, and when we talk about spiritual, you know, there's that hopelessness and lack of belief that anyone really can care or that they have um, worthiness in their life to be cared for. Um, physical impact is devastating with all sorts of STDs and, and um, injuries and you know, HIV and all pregnancies that might not be, that are unwanted often. And you know, a lot of um, the tattooing, brain injury. We see many of the women we serve at Terebinth have had um, some brain injury from the abuse that they sustain. And a person has to realize it's not just the trafficker that is causing these things, but often also the buyers who feel entitled and feel like, well, I paid for you, I can do as I please. Then we look at social impact. Um, and again, all of those things that as a child, if you have not had opportunity to do and to grow in a healthy environment where you're learning skills and where you're learning emotional communication, how you communicate with people, but in, with the social impact of um, trafficking and exploitation, you're really looking at um, people who have this homelessness and the disconnection and the isolation and often very much pulled away from any types of supports um, in, their, in their life. And then the emotional impact, you know, the anger, the rage, the humiliation, the shame, all of those, the self-blaming and loathing because the trafficker is saying, this is all you're good for. This is who you are. And so those are all, and when you look at this again, it's very holistic. It's really um, an issue that needs to be dealt with in a holistic way. So when we talk about survivors with addictions, we are talking about often um, women who have been in this life more than likely since they were teenagers. Um, and so by the time they become adults, they're coping, they've had to cope with the day in and day out abuse. And so that's where the, the chemical addictions do come in. And um, that's one way it can come in is just trying to cope with what they're having to deal with. And there, as we just saw, the, the, the mental health is just through the roof and they're are trying to cope with being able to just survive day in and day out. So coping with all of that trauma, many traffickers um, are forcing their women to sell. So the, our local officers here who work the trafficking task force um, investigative team, they are seeing it very much hand in hand, drugs hand in hand um, with the, the sexual exploitation and the, the prostitution. So um, we are looking at women who are forced to be selling that. And of course, then of course they would be more than likely taking those drugs as well. And then it's called a leash or being on the leash with those kinds of traffickers who actually put their women on drugs to make them continue to come back to them. And so they, they form that dependence and then, um, you know, are exploiting it by saying, well, you can't do anything or you can't get any more drugs. So you get out and do this or do that and that type of thing. So, so what I've seen working for many years with youth and then now switching to adults. Um, yes, many of the youth had tried, experimented, had taken drugs, but now with the women that come to Terrence Refuge, we see a high majority of them having addiction issues. And so those have to be addressed. So here's another statement. I have been in an emergency room only to be treated like a common criminal. From emergency personnel to EMTs, it didn't seem to cross their minds to offer a resource or even that I needed help. And what this says to me, because I've seen it and heard about it, is, is people not understanding, not understanding how these women came to this point in their life and making judgments. And so as professionals, it is so important to educate yourself and also to learn and understand that these women come to this situation most often because they really did not have the choice and they've been abused. And, and often many of the women we serve have been sexually abused since they were children. 
And then that really sent them on that trajectory to becoming an exploited or trafficked victim. And so really they have been, um, we have to really have that kind of compassion, which I'm sure <laughs> you as, as professionals have that, but it's so important because I know I've seen situations in the community and I know staff have talked about situations when some of our women are going to get services. Um, and we've in, in one situation, I think of a gal who came with the staff, staff said, I'll stand back, you go to the window, get the, um, you need what she was needing, uh, a social service um, provider was to give her um, some paperwork, that type of thing. And the staff observed this woman who really looked down at her, looked at her disgustedly, you're back here again, you know, really was um, degrading until the staff stood up and said, hey, you know, she deserves the opportunity to get this service and um, please help her get what she's asking for. And so sometimes we are finding people who just don't understand and um, are making those judgments and really not helping these victims to get the help that they need. So we talk about who can shift the system. And, you know, I don't know all of what everyone's positions are and what part of the medical system, but I do know that, again, when you are having victims being dropped off at the hospital by their traffickers or by the police, um, people have been beaten and bruised and just horrific situations, then really medical emergencies are pivotal um, moments when they can be uh, intervened, when intervention can come for this person, because oftentimes they are not, they are in the control of their trafficker. And even, I've even heard of situations in our um, center care system uh, where they've dealt with traffickers who really were constantly coming in the door, constantly answering for this victim, trying to intervene to make sure that she did not get that opportunity to um, be able to disclose the need that she really had. So um, being able to shift the system is all of the folks that are working, paramedics, nurses, victim advocates, registration staff who are observing and seeing what's going on in the waiting rooms, doctors, administrators, and social workers. And so it's really being, again, knowledgeable and knowing where to go, what to do, how to intervene for this victim. And so we talk about steps towards change would mean adopting screenings and response protocols. And I know there's hospitals, I know um, Mayo has done this. I know our hospital system here in St. Cloud has been working on, and I think have pretty much completed a um, screening and protocols for what are they gonna do? Um, how do we train our staff? They, you know, our training staff and how are the staff are gonna respond when they suspect or recognize there's a victim. So we want to have trauma-informed care and we wanna have compassionate questions and we wanna know that we are separating that person from the trafficker and how do we do that um, and be able to give this woman an opportunity. Not that they're always going to disclose or they're always gonna say, help, I'm being trafficked because the fear is very real, very, tangible and um, very, very hard for these victims to know they'll be safe if they say that this is what's going on. And then we're wanting to find immediate support. And so I know in our community, we have the sexual assault center that will come to the hospital um, if called to be an advocate for a victim and be able to start um, offering services and how they can get that help. I know in our um, state of Minnesota, we have our whole safe harbor, um, no wrong door model, and there are navigators in every region of the state, and they are an excellent source of resource for anyone looking to find resources for a victim. And we often encourage not to call law enforcement right away because that really can be a very fearful and um, not that I mean, there's, we have great officers in St. Cloud and there are a lot of officers who are really trained well to um, understand these victims and to be trauma informed, but usually that's not the first choice because that's just not gonna go well with the victims. And then being able to connect them to these services. So like I said, the Safe Harbor Network has a lot of services. I know inpatient treatment um, needs to come first and we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, Minnesota Human Trafficking Task Force, and also there are other programs around the state that are working with adults. So it's 
it's um, doing, you know, your research and knowing and often the navigators are very good at giving all of those resources for the various ages that are served throughout the state. So I always ask people just to imagine if you were, let's say you were 30, no, let's say 28 and you have been trafficked and exploited since you were 12 and you have not had any schooling or you've missed a lot of schooling, you have no job, I mean, no, no opportunity to get a job because here you have no skills on how you would even fill out an application. How would you sit before someone and do an interview that's, you know, with, you think about your mental health, I have anxiety and I am depressed. And you think about your addiction issues. And even if I got a job, I got to, you know, I got to take this drug or I can't function. So there are so many vulnerabilities and barriers to those victims who have been exploited. And I know by the time women come to us at Terrence Refuge, they can't even fathom a life beyond this. And so at Terrence, we actually have worked with women as young as 18, and we've worked with women as old as 56 to date. And so if you think about being 56 and being in this life for those many years, it is very difficult for a woman to think she can ever make a life for herself. And so some of those vulnerabilities, you know, is homelessness. They might be away from a tra trafficker now, but they um, have no stable housing. And how do you get stable housing if you can't get a job? <laughs> and so, um, you know, we have women who come to us who are just surviving survival sex. So they aren't being trafficked, but they are doing sexual exploitation services to be able to survive. And you look at lack of identification because the trafficker often takes everything from you. And so I know that's one of the things we often are doing right away when women come in with case management is finding, getting their social security cards, getting the different forms of identification that have been stripped from them. We find these women have a very, it's a very common for history of sexual abuse, as I said previously. And so um, another barrier that sets a person on that trans trajectory. Um, history of mental health issues, uh, the criminal charges, the lack of education. Sometimes they have children and the traffickers hold them, those children over their head or the women. That's the one thing they love in this life. And they um, do not want to go to social services because they are fearful that um, those children will be taken from them. I see there's a question. It is very true that um, trans folks are often because they are marginalized and set out from their families, they are very much at high risk. Another very high risk um, group is Native Americans. Um, considering how much the, there is um, for the population, there is a very high percentage of Native American girls who have been exploited in traffic in many um, tribes, it's a matter of when, um, and it's that you know, it's pretty prevalent in that population. And I see another question, what kind of sentences are the traffic getting? Um, well, um, it's getting better in our state. We do, you know, and in certain pockets like here in central Minnesota, our um, county attorney is doing an amazing job because we have a whole investigative team and they work hard to um, not um, criminalize our victims, but to get build relationships so that they're able to start sharing. And um, so we, as for sentences, you know, I, I know if it's with children, it's a very, very long sentence. Um, and I guess I can't tell you exactly, you know, I know that people are locked away for three, four or five years, but I, I don't know. It, I, I think it depends on all this, the circumstances and what's happened there. Um, back in um, about family members in the sex trade, I um, have a gal who, um, was trafficked by a family member who was part of a whole network. This was way back in the um, 90s and it was the Evans family and everyone in the family were traffickers. So there was um, the uncles, the dads, the brothers, the grandpas, everyone was traffickers. It was a huge trafficking ring. And so sometimes people are brought up in that in that kind of um, family or your family is one that just will sell sell you because you they have needs. And so that's really difficult. And then foster care system, 
you know, aging out is um, a problem if a person does not have the support that's needed to surround them. If they don't have a family that they can go back to for holidays and um, to celebrate successes, it is very likely that they can end up trafficked and exploited. Okay, let me, okay. So Terrebinth Refuge, we are a Christ-centered shelter and a safe home and we bring hope, healing services and freedom to sexually exploited and trafficked women. And, and when we say Christ-centered, we know um, when I started this program, I knew that I would not require Christian programming because these women come with all sorts of um, fear and uncertainty and hopelessness and unsurety of who even God is. And so how we view the way that we approach the women is how we see Jesus approached people, accepting them right where they're at, not pushing, not forcing, no judgment, giving them opportunity to make choices and to heal in their life. And so that's very important for us at Terrence Refuge. But we um, are a program that really brings that openness for them. And, they, and we'll talk about how they are, um, the kinds of goals they'll do. So I'm looking at another question. What is the incentive for traffickers? I get he control issue, but it's a very, okay. So traffickers are making huge buckets of money and it is very lucrative. And, uh, you know, if they have a stable of last figures I had heard, and this was a while ago, if they had a stable of three women, it's called a stable, which is pretty derogatory. Um, they can make upwards to, you know, $600,000 a year. And there's no tax taken out of that. And so that's why at this point, oops, I didn't mean to go that way. Let me go back. Um, that's why it is so prevalent. It is very lucrative. And I know in our state, we have um, issued um, some policies in hotels because that's where a lot of it goes on. But now in our state, they actually have to train all of their staff. And what we're finding is that it's still going on in hotels, and but it's also being pushed into apartment buildings, into homes. I've heard people talk about um, knowing that there's trafficking going on in the house down the street because there's people coming and going all the time and women outside and all that. So it is highly lucrative. And that is really what is driving you know, traffickers and um, exploiters to um, be able to continue doing that work, if you want to call it work. <laughs> so, Terrence Refuge, we have two pro two homes, and so we have our shelter program and our transitional program. And so, um, what's important about this when we're talking about working with victims who are addicted, we really have to look at the holistic healing that needs to happen to truly get out of this life. And so that's our, our goal for the women that come through our program. Um, they come into shelter and we give them time to rest and, and to just um, get acclimated to feeling safe. And it's so important to have a safe place for them. And in our programs, we're doing crisis counseling and we're doing trauma-informed work with them. And we have a case management that is um, bringing that holistic healing, which I will talk to you about and we partner with a lot of programs in our community. And when it comes to chemical dependency, we are partnering with um, outpatient treatment programs, but we also provide some support programs within our organization as women do outpatient treatment. And then our transition program is an option for women when they are um, wanting to, after they've gone through our first three phases, if they want to go on to our transition home where they are a little more independent, they are buying their own food, they are working by then because we have a strong employment readiness program, and they are um, really practicing and getting ready for their own home, their own apartment. And so that's what we do in the transitional program. You see another question. Um, we tend to be full. We were short staffed like so many people. And so we were kind of holding back on filling the homes. And now we've gotten to a point still needing um, one full time, one part time, but feeling um, like we have enough staff that we can refill. So we had a waiting list for a little while. We were at eight, we dropped down, and now we're slowly filling back up. So in our shelter, we can house 10, but we frame that nine women and um, uh, a mo one's a mom and a baby. And then transition, there's um, three women and a baby is how we frame our capacity. And really, when it talks about length of stay, we 
really don't put a limit on it. We figure about two years can really truly be probably long enough and we've had women get close to that, but many about nine months. So it's really individual and we're very much about that, making sure that they are, if they get through the, trans, you know, as they get through transition and they've saved enough money to put um, money towards an apartment and some of the things they need, then we're looking at helping them move along into their own place. Let's see. So our holistic approach, how I frame that is um, body, mind, soul, and spirit. And I will go into that in more detail, but it's so important to heal that whole, whole person. So body health, we describe that as a um, first a place that's safe because you cannot heal if you do not feel that you are safe. And that is critical. So we have safety measures in place and we have, um, you know, we don't advertise the homes, even though we do have many volunteers who come out and um, we really meet the women with those ba basic needs and without judgment. And then um, it's trauma-informed care. We have a registered nurse on staff and she comes uh, twice a week and she is um, doing assessments immediately and making referrals to take care of any physical needs. And she does a lot with our goals of wellness and programming. And so she's educating, she's helping women to understand their medications and their purposes and why they're on them. Um, you know, working with nutritious eating and, and exercise programs. So helping them to defi define and identify the types of goals they want to do in meeting that wellness and that health um, for themselves. And we look for ways like what's been really neat is we've been doing essential oils, and so it's been great to see the women um, be educated on that and making the choice to use those sometimes versus uh, medication. So they've learned that this, this brings calming. So I don't need my anxiety med all the time. And so we're always looking to really educate them on how to eat well, that's going to help and all those, those types of things. So that's body health. And then mind health, and this is the area that I know you guys are really interested in, is the mental health and the chemical health for drug addictions. And so at Terrebinth Refuge, um, Mind health, how we describe the work in this area is, um, you know, really having crisis counselors immediately on hand, um, a counselor who works with our women when they come in the door. And what we've seen is in the last year, we have increased our crisis counselor to be there more and we're seeing more stability for our women. And so women come in and that's who they see right away because when we first started, we tried to make appointments with therapists and then they would just not go and you just can't keep doing that. And so this has worked well. So we're, we're really um, giving them opportunity to start to debrief and to start talking. Um, we also use have survivor advocates. And so we have some staff that are survivors and there really is um, nothing like that for a woman to have someone who's walked through this to walk alongside of them. And so that's an important part with Terrebinth Refuge. Um, Trauma-based therapy. We have our own dog, Lily, in the backyard. She is a great Pyrenees and is proving to be an amazing healing um, factor for our women. And then we partner with Angel Reigns in our community. And I, my work at Heartland really taught me because that was all about horses, um, the power and healing qualities of horse work. And so our women go out there regularly. We have sex trafficking spe specific education that um, the women's get right away into these groups that are that are teaching them about the game that was played on them and what has what really the truth about all of it. And we have various um, other groups like coping skills and DBT and healthy boundaries and um, those types of um, groups that are essential for health and mental wellness. And then of course, our chemical dependency treatment. And so we recognize at Terrence Refuge, if someone is in need of inpatient treatment, they really can't be at Terrebinth until that's taken care of. And so we've had, um, we do screenings. It's like we have a crisis number and um, we people come to us in various different ways, but calling that crisis number, we're taking them through a screening and we're really trying to assess with where they are with their chemical health. Um, we bring women in who need treatment 
But again, if they are needing inpatient, they are just not going to get anything done while they're with us until that's that's taken care of. And then we have support groups. So I know the women go with staff to uh, celebrate recovery, and we've had um, volunteers who come in and do an AANA groups with our women as they are working through their sobriety. And then when we talk about soul health, um, we're talking about really self-discovery, those individual skills, abilities, talents, and interests that we all have, and an opportunity to really discover what that is. And so we, our case uh, manager puts, you know, goals for them in these areas, and what they really center around is either education. So if a woman is wanting to get her high school diploma or GD, we've had women go to college, um, we make sure there's a way for them to get enrolled and into those programs. And another a very important part of that is our employment readiness program. It is critical for our women. And so we have a very strong employment readiness, which um, was designed by a survivor. And we are able to do modulars through the basics of employment and what that looks like and how you communicate on the job, how you dress, all those kinds of basics that many of us got when we were in school. Um, and then from there, they do some one-to-one -one on building um, a resume and filling out applications and doing mock interviews. And we're, we're really pleased to say that we were um, we have an amazing um, opportunity now for women where they can actually work in our social enterprise, which is our hope and healing store. So they go there to practice the skills they've learned for at least a minimum of 60 hours. And if um, with evaluation, if things are going well, then they move on to a job in the community. And we've seen a lot of success with that. And then the other part of soul health is really recreation and leisure. And we make sure that women are having opportunities to discover the kinds of things they might want to do for the rest of their life. So whether that's, you know, crafts or gardening or baking or um, sewing or um, physical fitness, any of those things, we often engage volunteers to come in and teach those skills and allow the women the opportunity to discover their interests. So that's the soul health and, and independent living skills is part of that. You know, that's part of our programming where they're just learning the basics of main, maintaining a home and all of the shopping and all those pieces and financial responsibility. And we also um, partner with Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid to help them in some of those legal issues that kind of dog them to be able to move forward in their life. And then Spirit Health, again, we are a Christian program, but again, we do not require, we don't force course or require Christian program, but we do provide opportunities. Um, women can uh, make choices to go to church or to a Bible study and or to have mentorship or any of those things. And if a woman is wanting to um, move in a certain direction, we make sure that we allow them the opportunity. So we've, you know, had a lot going on since the, we opened our doors, April of 218. I'm not going to read through all this, but we are finding um, we started with a lot of women coming in and many of them wouldn't last. They'd stay for three days, two days, one, five, six, some long. And what we've recognized is really making sure we're addressing the, the um the chemical health as soon as we can, make sure we're screened as best we can those that really need treatment and so referring them to an inpatient. Um, so we do the, um, the assessments and we make sure that we part, you know, are getting them to the outpatient. So it's pretty common for many of our women to be doing outpatient treatment while they're in our program and um, doing um, the work that they are required in that. And in our community, we um, work with an effective living center and sobriety first, and they have been good partners in making sure the women get the care they need. But we um, are seeing now with the additional mental health work that we do, we're finding women are staying longer because they're getting that help immediately and you know more than once a week and so that gives the women an opportunity to really settle in and start working on themselves and the needs that they have. Um, I think about um, one of our gals that we have in the program even currently and she came to us uh, over a year ago. I'll call her Miss M. And Ms. M was um, a younger gal, probably like 26. I think she, no, yeah, I think she was, when she came in, she was probably 25 or 26, but she came in the program, really felt very comfortable, um, was starting her work, um, 
she got very excited about the horse programming and was involved there. But she had a couple of hang, you know, a couple of relapses, I guess was what you'd say. And we aren't ones to quickly just throw someone out if they take a drug or if something happens on that order. We're really making sure that they get the evaluation that they need. And we are making sure that what is needed, it happens. So it turns out she was assessed as someone who really did need inpatient. And so we made arrangements, helped find an inpatient program for her. Um, she went to the inpatient program, was there, let's see, uh, sometime from the spring, well, the summer, all the way to um, before the holidays, um, completed it successfully, and then wanted to come back because she had built the relationships that we um, really help them to do is having strong, healthy relationships, and she was making some progress. So I can say at this point, um, this gal has gone through all of our employment readiness. She's working in the community. She's continuing her therapy, um, really moving forward in all of her goals. And so she's just another really good example of how once that chemical dependency issue is really been addressed, even though we know it's a lifelong process, um, she is now able to function and move forward and have clarity in the goals that she wants for herself and the support that is needed is, um, is there for her. And so we really anticipate her to eventually get in the transition house and continue, she's working, saving her money, looking at some point for her to get into an apartment. And I see a question. Any tips on how to talk to your teenage girls about this topic and warning signs to watch for to avoid falling into sex trafficking? Are teenage girls addicted to this type of work? Um, that's a really good question. Um, what is unfortunate and what is happening in our day and age is many teenage girls are being groomed online. And um, it's, you know, yes, there are people who will approach girls at maybe the mall or, um, you know, at places where kids frequent, but what is happening a lot is online solicitation. And so how that looks is um, traffickers will sit behind the computer and send out messages to young gals and see who bites. And what he's looking for is really that gal that, especially those gals that are saying, oh, my life sucks. My parents don't understand. I'm bullied at school. My mental health, I'm feeling anxiety every day. Looking for vulnerable young people to start engaging with. And they will just slowly send out a couple of messages. Oh, hey, I, you know, you, you're cute. And, you know, I see we like the same band. And yeah, you know, parents can be really hard and really start identifying with this child. And they take their time. I mean, they'll go weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks developing a relation, a trusting relationship. And youth, you know, their brains aren't developed, you know, and they're they're thinking this this guy is like an 18 year old person when actually could be a 30 year old man. And they are listening, hearing, you know, to the, this emotional attachment starts developing because this person is really saying, you know, you can trust me. I know your parents probably don't do so, you know, are very, you know, really starting to separate them from their support system. And there, then there'll become a time when they'll say, hey, I'll be in town, you know, do you want to meet at the McDonald's and we can have, I'll treat you to a, a dinner or whatever. And suddenly that, that girl is gone. And this is happening over and over again. So we need to really give our children um, skills around social media and, um, you know, because that's where a lot of it's happening. And these kids, you know, really think that they are safe there. And they, oh, it's just a friend. It's just a guy who really gets me and understands me. But then it really starts to really entangle them. So uh, we need to talk to our children, unfortunately, earlier than um, I feel like what I grew up with. Um, things have really escalated. And so it's really important to be able to let children know and your young ladies to that, to warn them about what's going on online and those social media chats. I know with um, the gaming and the boys, I know there's a lot of traffickers who do back doors and gaming and are connecting to kids in that way. And, um, and then the other thing is the whole area of pornography, which really escalates and has really um, exasperated this problem. And so um, we again have to talk about our little boys, to our little boys about 
at 10 year old, these boys are seeing pornography. They're little kid on the bus, hey, look what I found. And then you have to be able to tell your kids this is addictive, it's gonna destroy your brain and it's gonna destroy any opportunity to have a um, good relationship in the future. And I had an officer say to me, well, Everyone who looks at porn doesn't buy a woman, and that's true. But what he said is every tra every person who has abused women sexually in this way has bought women was very entangled in pornography. And we know that the women in those videos are being um, trafficked and exploited. And so that's another thing we have to warn our children about as well. So unfortunately, we have to have these discussions early and um, and really help them to know they can come to you and be safe and talking about it. You don't want to give them the old, <laughs> and when they come to you, you want to really let them know it's safe to be able to say, hey, my friend is having this issue, or I saw this, and um, so they can feel safe, because the minute you um, really respond in a way that's going to drive them away, then you don't have that opportunity anymore. So. Um, I have our people often ask me, what is a terebinth tree? Uh, or not a terebinth tree, what is terebinth refuge? And I tell them about a tree that grows in the Middle East. It's a very much like an oak tree. So I figure a terebinth tree is a cousin to an oak, very spreading. And in the Old Testament, um, it talks about a place where they built monuments and they came together under the tree to, to, to socialize and to rest. And they're very hardy. Uh, in drought seasons, they stay green. If you cut them, they keep growing. And so for us at Terrebonne Refuge, they really speak of resilience and strength and growth and, and healing. And I know there is a few stories in the, in the Bible about um, like Goliath was slain in the Valley of Terebinth and Abraham was said to have met with the angels under the Terebinth tree. And, and so they really speak of rest, peace, healing and growth. So I, I always answer, you say that because people say, where do you get that name? <laughs> And then this is the scripture that we use um, at Terrence Refuge as our foundation scripture and really wanting the women to become that oak of righteousness that is a display of God's splendor. Yeah, I'm trying to, so there's just some of those, but there's my name and contact. Are there other questions that I can answer? Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to unleash Heather on you. Uh -huh. She's got quite a few questions here. Okay, so. that's fine. I, I like questions. Oh, gosh. Um, okay, my, my question, one of my questions is, um, what percentage of traffickers are women? You know, I don't, I don't know a percentage, but I know that it's happening. And I know that um, even young people are trafficking each other. So I remember hearing the story of a gal who was kind of a popular gal in school and she um, wanted to get a, some kind of Gucci purse or something. And so she set, she set up, there was gonna be a party and she set this one gal who was kind of a loner and didn't have many friends and invited her to come. But she had already set up with these football players that, you know, I'll get her in this room and you can do whatever, but I get this money for that. So that's, that's trafficking and kids and kids often are being forced by their trafficker to get more girls. So they'll say, you need to go out and get another girl. So she's like, oh, I got this guy. He's really cool. Look at my nails. He makes, does this for me. Um, but I also know that there are women, I think of a situation in Alexandria where a woman was exploiting and trafficking boys. Um, and so I think it's smaller amount, but um you know, that does happen. The trafficker can look like, well, I think of another situation in St. Cloud where a woman had a, um, it was in the newspaper, she was running a dog grooming business, but she was trafficking girls out the back door. And so, yes, it can happen with any type of person, but I would say majority are men. So now, are a lot of these victims, are they moved to like somewhere else where they're it's not their local environment or you know I'm just or are they all like in a way kidnapped or is this happening while they're still at home so um many of these as I said many of these trafficking victims we as adult that we are working with as adults were trafficked since they were teenagers and often traffickers get them away from their family support their community anyone who might be looking and and then they are moving them about so traffickers are very opportunistic and they are you know you probably heard you know when the when the um 
the Super Bowl was in town years ago, um, that there was a lot of presentations, a lot of boards saying, if you see the something, do, do this. And so traffickers go to where they can get the business. And so if they know in, you know, Final Four or Super Bowl, um, in Minnesota, hunting and fishing season, the bars turn strip clubs and traffickers are moving their women in there. So yes, they move them around. I can tell you about a gal that I know really well who she was trafficked for many years of her teenage life into adulthood. And she talked about how her trafficker would put her on a plane to Las Vegas. Um, he had had her work this convention of men who had come to Las Vegas and then she wired the money back and then got on the plane and came back to him and you think you think you know why did you have all this money why didn't you take off and he basically said just know if you think you're going to get away with my money just know I've got people watching you and I will kill you and she knew he was capable of that because when she first got in his grips, he beat a woman mercilessly in front of everyone and said, this is what's going to happen to you if you think you're going to not do what I told you to do. So, um, yeah, I forgot what the question, but yes. Oh, this is the question. So I guess to piggyback on that, though, is how do they like how are they reassured or assured that like there is safety? Because, you know, for someone to come forward, yeah, it's one thing to protect yourself, but if you've heard all these threats that I'm going to go kill your yeah. kid, family, like. Yeah. So it really takes, you know, it really takes them being able to be in a safe place and know they're safe. So in our community, again, we have an amazing task force and we have officers who are very trauma informed. And so women that come to us, from this community, even though we get them all over the state, know that these guys are the way that they are. They've seen them on the streets. They're very supportive. They'll say, hey, do you need to get to the hospital, blah, blah, blah. Um, when women come and stay at Terrebonne and as they start to, to um, feel that they're safe and doing some therapy and doing some work, we've had quite a few women say, I'm ready, talk, ready to talk to the officers and to turn evidence against my trafficker. So they have to feel safe. Um, and know that, and then really, when it comes to traffickers, they're very arrogant. Um, they figure, oh, she'll come back to me, you know. And so they don't want to get caught, especially if they're trafficking children, because that's going to put them away for a long time. And so they'll just go get other children. Um, they figure this adult will come back to them, and if they don't, they they'll just get other women. So we have. We are in a location in our community that's right on the edge of town, very close to everything. And it's nice um, that we have security measures, cameras, those kinds of things in place. But we have seen very little. I think we've had two situations where we had um, someone come and knock on the door and we just push the panic button and then the police were there shortly. <laughs> so um, they usually aren't going to make those efforts because they don't want to get caught. Can you, can you just give an example? I think, you know, working in addiction clinics, a lot of us take care of patients with substance use disorders. I mean, and recently I've seen a lot of women in that 20 year old age group that I'm pretty worried about, right? And they're very, mm -hmm. they're very, they don't talk much. So is right. there, is there a certain kind of language you would use to approach this? Well, yeah. it's, once there's some trust built, um, being able to talk about, you know, Usually they don't use the word trafficking or sexual exploitation. It's more about trading sex for whatever needs they might have had, or it's their, often that's what it is, or it's their boyfriend, you know, that's, they have this relationship where they, you know, he, we needed money, you know, so it's really, there is word, there is wording, there is terminology, but a lot of it is just understanding that they sometimes don't even see it that way. And they just feel like they're doing favors for their boyfriend. We have women, like I said, in their 50s, and that's their husband who is exploiting and trafficking them. Um, so I think it's really first, it's them being able to know that they are safe in your care, and then being able to just ask them questions that are really pointed to how are you, how are you living right now? You know, you, where do you live? You know, you start to see kind of darty eyes and, you know, around, you know, don't have any straight answers. Then you can start to quote. Then, then I would bring in someone, maybe an advocate or someone who is through the safe Harbor network that would be able to really point them in the right directions and get the help.
you know, get them the help they need. But it, it, it can be hard in that, that age group because they don't see it that way. Um, and they aren't very quick to disclose because there is fear. And it, again, it comes down to building the trust, being able to talk, you know, being able to really assure them that they are safe there and we can get this type of um, safety that you would need if you are able to just share and get the help that we want to offer you. So I don't know if that's helpful, <laughs> but that's. Um, I have like one more question and then I don't know if Charlie, how long your case would be to, to talk about, but just to kind of give the high level. Um, what is kind of what you see as like your average number of years for the victims? You know, is it, you know, 12 to 30? Is it like, is there like a, an average? Oh, okay. So I'm, so average year of being exploited. How long do they how long, Yeah, they no, how traffic? long of, yeah, is each, like, how, what's the average and length of time um, a female is being trafficked? Well, again, it's really if they get intervention. So, you know, we have amazing youth, youth facilities in our state. Um, all over our state. So if we can get those kids, you know, they're identified quickly, then we're really going to have a handle on getting them out of getting into more, being in it for very long. But literally, we have worked with women in their 50s. And, um, and so it's, it's really about intervention. And I know it's a very, and then there's the women that have died. I mean, there's all sorts of, so people often talk about so many years in this life, you're going to end up dead. Um, you know, on the hands of your trafficker, at the hands of a buyer. Um, it's a violent life, the drug overdose, drug addiction, as you know, well know, and also um, the physical issues that come with, with living in this life. So I don't know if there's an average because you've got people who, you've got all these kids in Safe Harbor right now that are getting help and hopefully they'll stay out and get the skills they need and then not end up dead. <laughs> Yeah. Really, do you have a, yeah. I don't know how long and complex, but I think I can, I can say the basic thing in just a minute. Sure. Uh, that was an amazing presentation. I learned a lot. And one of my questions I think was answered by you, but uh, about a month ago, a 17 year old was brought to the hospital after an opioid overdose. Mm -hmm. um, and then they consulted me and she told me, you know, she was in an abusive home and two months ago she left home. And she found a new family on the street. Um, it turned out she's syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea positive. Mm -hmm. um, she told me, oh, I have a boyfriend. I have sex with a couple partners. But, you know, she really referred to them as her family. This was only two to three months. She was very positive about them. She wanted to go be with them again. Mm -hmm. She was using opioids. They gave her drugs, mm -hmm. fentanyl and methamphetamines. And this was her first overdose, but she's only used those drugs for two months. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, and so we decided to put her on Suboxone, but the decision to treat her opioid addiction was tough because she'd only been using for two months. She'd not even had withdrawal. And we were really back and forth on whether we should treat her opioid addiction or not with medications. And we ended up doing it. But I guess my questions, I just wanted to share that episode. And yeah. one is she really did not, she said only good things about her family. Yeah. yeah. Um, she and didn't I've go seen... back to her original home. Mm -hmm. um, and she didn't really open up about how she got all these different STIs. Um, yeah. So any thoughts or reactions to that case? Well, that's really common. And they aren't going to disclose if they're fearful, you know, that they're going to be hurt. Her family obviously is a trafficking type situation. Um, and so it's really, it's being, you said she was 17. So she is in that youth age where I would definitely get a safe harbor um, navigator or, or facility to be able to talk to her and get her the services. Because if she goes back to that family, she will be in the same situation and will yeah. end up. You know, and they obviously you must have a group of girls and, you know, they often see themselves as a family. They they had child protective services involved and ended up sending her to another family member that they thought was safe. But she still had ready access to everyone. Yeah. And um, she no showed her first appointment. 
Um, so we, there is a child protective service person involved and she's still 17 for another month, yeah. one month. Yeah. So I think maybe I'll reach out and try to get her connected to safe Harbor. Yeah. I, that's, I would suggest that because yeah, when she turns 18, then you really can lose her. <laughs> so, so yeah. I have a question with that, just, you know, to connect her with a safe Harbor advocate, especially if, you know, you have no choice in this, like she, she goes to it that, you know, a different, you know, gets released from the hospital or whatever. Do they just ever, like, if, if Charlie were to say, hey, I'm seeing her on this date, be there when she's there in the clinic rather than trying to hold her longer? Because if, if her traffickers in the waiting room, they might be getting antsy. We need to leave. Like, would they just be there, like, when she shows up, like, to, to meet for the appointment or? You're saying a safe harbor person? Yeah. Yes, yes. You could make an arrangement, explain the situation. They would find someone in the community that you're in that could meet and be able to um, have a discussion with her and really very, you know, really know how to direct and guide her into an understanding of what's going on more than likely, hopefully get some more direct answers and then be able to um, do an intervention of whatever is they feel is the best way. Mom, I had a patient. I, I would just say, like, I we really went around and around on whether we should give her buprenorphine, but listening to the talk, if the opioids are part of the control, I, I do feel like buprenorphine makes me feel even better about choosing to give her buprenorphine if opioids are being used to control her, yeah, separate but, from the fact that she might overdose again and all the rest. Yeah, and, and I can't speak to my knowledge on those various types of drugs and how you treat is not... Yeah. I'm not strong in that area, but I do know whatever can help her to get into a more of a right mind so that she can make some decisions as she has got folks working with her. I, it was interesting. I'm just going to touch on this patient I saw last week and we're talking about her childhood. But anyway, she ran away from home right before she turned 13 and said she was living with these friends and, you know, she'd have sex with these people. And I, I just looked at her and I'm like, and she's 50 something now. and and. and She's, she was only there for two months. Somehow she got away from it, but she didn't even think it is bad. You know, she, <laughs> I said, you were trafficked. And she's like, oh no. I mean, it was even hard, like 40 years later to have this, like to have her completely understand. And she's healed from a lot of it in a, a lot of ways, but mm -hmm. um, it, it was, it, I think that's interesting. It's kind of like what Charlie said, just that not understanding of even what is going on. Yes, and that's not uncommon. Even women who come into our program really struggle to admit or to really identify what truly was happening. Um, and so, yes, especially when they're young and there's such a pressure in our society to um, be out there and to do, you know, it just, there's so much pressure. And and then there's, there's um, Homelessness is really um, couch hopping a lot of times too. So they, to survive, you know, someone says, hey, you can stay with me, but you're gonna have to do this with me, you know, and that type of thing. So it's not uncommon for them to not understand fully and to be told, you know, given mixed messages from those that are buying or those who are selling. And, you know, you're really making this decision and this is, you know, you're helping out the family or whatever, so, yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, we're. A about out of time. Uh, boy, I tell you, that was a talk that kept the crowd right to the end here. We really appreciate so much you coming on and, and kind of sharing what you do, because I think it was eye-opening for all of us. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. This is great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. We will see you again next week. We'll have Marie McAllister on. And again, thanking Cece for this as a wonderful talk. So have a good week, everyone. Thank you.